very well warmed and respected academics. Well, we are here for the third academic session, and this is going to be a sort of a composite presentation of different aspects uh, which are relevant from different angles so far as unity is concerned. Uh, in fact, I can foresee that this session would be more down to earth, taking human beings as they are constituted. Genomically, ethnographically, and also historically. The emphasis should be, I hope, less on the spirituality on which much has been spoken earlier. We have a distinguished panel of speakers with Professor Partho Majumdar coming first in the list and he does deserve our immediate attention in view of his very outstanding contributions. Uh, he has been modest enough to ask me not to <coughs> relate his biodata in detail. But let me at least say this much, that <coughs> Professor Mujumdar is currently the founding director of the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics in Kalyani, India on deposition from the Indian Statistical Institute, from where he had his master's and PhD. And uh, he, he is professor of the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Kolkata, and an honorary professor of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. This is a very paltry introduction, but uh, you will know more about him as he makes his presentation. His, uh, the, the, sub, the title of his paper <coughs> is An Approach to the issue of Indian unity from modern genomic science. Well, thank you very much for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, there is, as you can see, a slight change in the topic of my, um, in the title of my uh, talk. Uh, the title of my talk is Unity and Diversity of India, a Genomic Reconstruction from Ancestral Footfalls. Essentially, what I'm going to do, these, these words may, uh, may be very terse. But essentially what I'm going to do is to uh, reconstruct uh, the history of India and show you that there is uh, an underlying uh, theme of unity among the people of India using yeah. genomic knowledge. Um, many of you may know that uh, these genomes are passed on from parents to offspring. Um, the genomes are nothing but uh, the DNA that's contained within the chromosomes. These chromosomes are, in, uh, are, are contained in the cells. Uh, the information is passed on from one generation to the next. Um, the parental chromosome, the mix, the information that's contained in the parents, they mix, and they're passed on uh, to the offspring. So as you can see, because this happens every generation, uh, there is obviously a continuity of the information that's contained in the DNA, uh, and, and this continuity lingers on for a long period of time. Does it go on without any change at all? The answer is no. Um, in each generation, because of certain biological processes, uh, they, these are called mutations and recombinations, uh, there are slight changes that take place in the genomic information that there is as they are packaged and passed on from parents to offspring. So in each generation, there will be a little bit of a change that will accumulate um, as, as these populations evolve over a period of time. So essentially, we are talking about movement of information over time through procreation, through the biological process of procreation, as new generations are formed. Uh, it is the continuity, in spite of the little bit of change that there is in every generation, that allows us to reconstruct how humans may have evolved. So what I'm going to do is essentially to begin with, uh, tell you about how the human, modern humans as a species has evolved and moved around, as we know that humans have moved around and still continue to move around. Uh, and uh, in particular then focus on India and uh, talk about the underlying theme of unity of India as reconstructed from genomic data. So that's essentially uh, what the parameters of my talk, uh, uh, talk are. All right. So, um, so in, in, in some ways, we modern humans are unusual animals. 
we have a wide geographical distribution. If you look at other animals, they have restricted geographical distribution. For example, if you look at elephants, we have a very restricted uh, geographical distribution. But we as animals, human modern humans, human beings, we have a uh, very wide geographical di distribution. And we have adapted ourselves to a wide range of environmental conditions. Other animals uh, need special kinds of environments to live. But we have adapted ourselves to a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, another interesting feature of modern humans is that we choose our mates from within our own group. So in some sense, uh, we have a group identity. And we usually uh, tend to foster that uh, group identity by choosing mates from within our group. Um, if we form one large intermating group, if all over the world we form one large intermating group, oops, um, there would be uh, no obvious uh, physical or genetic distinctions among the groups. So everybody would be just completely randomly making, and we would the distinctiveness that there is, the group identity that there is, would be completely obliterated or lost. But that's not what happens because we choose mates from within our own group. As a result of humans tending to mate within their own groups, genetic variations tend to remain localized within the groups. And that's a feature of unity. On the other hand, uh, the different groups retain some measure of genetic distinctiveness, which essentially means that uh, between the groups, there, is, there are genetic differences, obvious differences in uh, uh, distinctive uh, differences <coughs> between the groups. And that's diversity. So um, uh, essentially, we are talking about uh, um, essentially, then we are talking about unity in the midst of diversity. And uh, what we have heard this morning is uh, are different kinds of unity, for example, spiritual unity. And one of the things that Professor uh, Sain pointed out at the end during the discussion is that it's, we embrace uh, the diversity, yet try and understand what are the threads of unity that there is um, in, in, the, in, the, in human populations as a whole, globally, and or in particular in India. So what I'm going to do is set up the paradigm and uh, along this paradigm provide some evidence to you. So we look at evolution of populations over a period of time. And let's start with a simple human population. So that's a, that's a population that we're looking at. And we're going to track the evolution of this population over time. So that's the arrow of time. We are looking forward in time. What we're going to do is eventually to uh, reverse the arrow of time. So if you look forward in time, that specific group that there was that they, they made it, the, uh, the numbers grew, and these individuals, the population size eventually grew. Uh, remember, we are talking about uh, several hundred, uh, maybe, maybe 100,000 years ago, maybe 50,000 years ago, when most of us were dependent on, uh, on whatever was available around us. So we were essentially hunter-gatherers. We were picking uh, berries and nuts from trees and uh, you know, uh, hunting animals around us and uh, for, for our own sustenance. In that restricted geographical area, as the numbers of individuals grew, there was pressure on natural resources. And this pressure on natural resources forced us to move uh, to explore new talents and, and, and move to other geographical areas. So to say that uh, you know, the, the, the population that there was in that specific geographical area uh, remained there, but new, uh, a subset of individuals moved to another place and populated a new geographical area. This process continued. That specific uh, uh, set of individuals, uh, oops, this is very strange. Uh, OK, that specific, so. Um, uh, this group of uh, individuals then moved out from this uh, in a set of individuals and migrated to a new geographical area. They also grew in size, and subsequently there was uh, pressure there on the natural resources, and they moved, um, formed these new, new um, uh, groups and subgroups. So what we can see is that from one ancestral population, these populations bifurcated over a period of time uh, because of pressure on natural resources, moved to new geographical areas, and uh, formed these uh, uh, you know, multiple populations. So if we were to reverse the arrow of time, we would look at uh, these, uh, these populations or genetic characteristics within these populations and, and uh, try and reconstruct how these populations may have evolved from this one ancestral population. So uh, if you look at uh, these two populations, since they have uh, an ancestral population nearer in time compared to these two populations that have two different ancestors, so these, these two populations would be genetically closer. 
And these two populations then would be genetically closer because they are related to uh, an ancestral population here. So based on the genetic uh, similarities among these populations, we can reverse the arrow of time and reconstruct this uh, so-called phylogenetic tree, which is, uh, to use a um, uh, in a technical term. So we can reconstruct how these populations have evolved by looking at the contemporary populations, reversing the arrow of time, and looking at their genetic uh, similarities. So that's a paradigm that, uh, that we use. Two populations that are genetically more similar than another population would have an ancestral pop or would have diverged from an ancestral population nearer in time compared to the other population with which uh, it's not so similar. So that's, that's uh, the overall paradigm. Uh, using this paradigm then, we try and understand how humans have, uh, may have evolved. So um, uh, these, these populations, um, uh, you know, even after they move, move to new geographical areas, essentially remain isolated, but there is some amount of admixture uh, by, by, um, by uh, exchange of mates between populations. And so these two populations, which uh, arose from this ancestral population and you know, moved out to new geographical areas, um, they accumulated new kinds of genetic variations, would become genetically distinct, but because of exchange of mates, <coughs> The exchange of mates uh, exchanges genes, and therefore they become they increase the genetic similarity between these populations. So the, the, the two features that uh, that that are prominent here, one is because of isolation, geographical isolation, uh, genetic distinctiveness arises, but also because of exchange of mates between isolated populations, genetic distinctiveness diminishes. So these are like two opposing forces which we must uh, which we must take into take into account in order to reconstruct human evolution. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, as I just said, that uh, genes, as, as uh, people move uh, from one geographical area to other geographical areas, they carry their genes, and genes move with people, and uh, these, these um, uh, exchange of mates uh, fosters genetic uh, similarity as opposed to uh, accumulation of genetic diversity. The barriers to admixture, the mixing of genes between two populations, one is a geographical barrier. Imagine, if you will, that there are two populations living on two sides of the Himalayan mountain belt. Um, it's very uh, unlikely that they will exchange mates between the two populations. So what, that's a barrier to admixture. And one of the major barriers to admixture is geographical barrier, which is a physical barrier. The cultural differences and linguistic differences, which you might think as language, you might think as a part of culture, uh, the other major barrier is that uh, linguistic differences and cultural differences. If uh, the prospective uh, husband and wife don't speak the same language, it's less likely that they will actually uh, marry and procreate uh, compared to uh, a, a, a male and a female who speak the same language. So linguistic differences also um, serve as uh, barriers to admixture. Um, as I said, human movements take place over a period of, over, over the course of human evolution, lots of human movements are taking place. Uh, initially, it's prompted by population <coughs> expansion because uh, most humans were hunter-gatherers to begin with. This population expansion uh, leads to pressure on natural resources. The pressure on natural resources leads them to migrate to new areas. Um, the, and, and, and as I said, that as they migrate to new areas, they, they carry their genes and the genes move with people. The, uh, along with migration and movement to new areas and uh, the independent thinking that modern humans have, they innovate. And this innovation leads to export export of, uh, uh, um, of, of uh, ideas. So there are two kinds of export that take place. One is um, uh, the, the, the export is in terms of innovation of ideas or ideas that lead to innovations. And the export can be a diffusion of ideas only with no physical movement of people. If there is no physical movement of people, then, uh, there, is, uh, then there is no movement of genes. And this is called cultural diffusion by word of mouth, so to say. There is also another way of uh, exporting ideas, which is through actual physical movement of people, uh, which is called demic diffusion. And when there is physical movement of people, there is going to be movement of genes. So this is called demic diffusion. I will come back to these two uh, different aspects of these, these two uh, opposing um, viewpoints with respect to cultural diffusion and demic diffusion when I talk about agriculture or the evolution of agriculture that led to massive population movements. And I'll uh, show you some weird data. Uh, genetic data with respect to this. Okay. So as I said, we have uh, we have our DNA, and in this DNA there are certain kinds of signatures, 
and uh, there are certain parts of the DNA that are that are uh, transmitted along the female line. It's transmitted to by the mother to all her children, um, and so on. So those are called that's a maternal lineage. So if we track signatures uh, that are contained in the part of the DNA that's only uh, transmitted by the mother, and this is called mitochondrial DNA, which is outside of the nucleus. Most of the DNA material is within the nucleus in the cell, but outside of the nucleus also there are certain kinds of DNA that are passed on by the mothers to all her offspring. The father plays no role at all. So if you're tracking that uh, signatures in that portion of the DNA, we are actually tracking female lineages if you do it over a long period of time. So uh, imagine, if you will, that these are three different kinds of signatures that we have. And let's just call them as one, two, and three. As you can see that we are tracking, uh, it, it's, it's like a necklace, right? So this necklace has three beads, and the one, one bead here is red. Uh, blue and yellow, and it distinguishes from this bead because this necklace because the bead here is white. So these three are three different kinds of necklaces that human beings are wearing, so to say, and these necklaces are passed on by the mother to all her offspring. So if we track the frequencies of these various kinds of necklaces in different populations, uh, the way that we do this is uh, we go to different populations, uh, tribal populations, caste populations, and so on. Um, in, in different parts of, uh, uh, let's say, of India or in different parts of the world, and a sample a number, let's say that from each of these 10 populations that we have uh, purposely chosen, we select randomly 100 individuals from each population and ask ourselves, uh, how many people are wearing this kind of a necklace, how many people are wearing this kind of a necklace, and how many people are wearing this kind of a necklace. In, uh, of course, these are not the only three kinds of necklaces that uh, an individual may be wearing, because there may be other kinds of necklaces also. So essentially, we enumerate the different kinds of necklaces that we find uh, people wearing. Um, and, and the wearing is in the DNA, not, not physically wearing. So uh, the signatures in the DNA and estimate the proportions of these different signatures. What do we find? One of the things that we find is that if you look at all over the world, uh, one major thing that you, uh, I, I'm probably going to skip this. Uh, one major thing that you find is, first of all, uh, you, if you uh, look at these necklaces, the necklaces are uh, a large number of necklaces can be found. So these necklaces have been called L1, L2, L3, etc. The interesting part is that these necklaces are such that uh, the ones that